Hello, I'm Shane Bill Kelly. And I'm Kyle Thompson. And you're listening to the first episode of General Intellect Unit. A uh, new podcast, completely new, completely fresh. Um, and we're going to be talking about the intersection of technology, philosophy, and politics with a particular left, or even, dare we say, communist kind of uh, interpretation. Uh, is that a fair description, Kyle? Uh, yes, I would agree, comrade. Fabulous. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, like I think, what what do we what, what do we want to do with this show? Um, I think we're kind of like into we want to kind of educate and portray a kind of leftist interpretation of like technology and where we are in society right now, how it relates to, uh, I suppose, all the the disasters and kind of incredible horrible stuff that's going on around us at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no lack of uh, catastrophes to talk about these days, and I think we can talk about how tech figures into that big picture there. Uh, But we also want to do some deeper dives on individual topics uh, relating to uh, tech and sort of socialist politics. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, I think it's kind of, I think the reason I wanted to start this show really was that I kind of see a lot of um, sort of pseudo-apolitical, kind of vague libertarian kind of nonsense floating around in the sphere of like technical workers and programmers and kind of general sort of middle class white collar sort of, you know, knowledge workers um, that kind of make, make make their living off of technology. And I think, frankly, that that kind of detached supposedly apolitical thinking is kind of bullshit, <laughs> you know, because uh, technology and politics are inseparable. Like, um, every everything you do in the world has an impact on the world. Like, and it's kind of crazy to claim otherwise. Yeah, we, we're, we're in society with each other and we're in society with the technology that we use, right? Um, it's all, all connected... It is, yeah, and like the the technology we have, it's like this kind of idea that um, the tools you have shape the context you're in, and the context you're in shapes the tools you have. There's a feedback loop between them. Um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and I also have. To, I, I know there are you know su- substantially left leaning technologists out there um, who might who might appreciate listening to this kind of I don't know rambling nonsense. Um, maybe I don't know. It could be a could be a huge failure. Who knows? Um, yeah, and I, I suppose it's kind of for me at least a kind of like I think I, I got into uh, left politics a long time ago. It was like eighteen, running with these kind of like anarchist, like anarcho communist kind of groups, and um, having a great time listening to uh, people who knew a lot more than I did um, educate me on these kind of kind of issues. And then a lot later, I came into technology, and I kind of. I left a bit of that kind of on the shelf for a while and I kind of, for a while, sort of bought into the vague, vague optimism of the tech, the, the kind of Silicon Valley culture, you know, the um, the idea that uh, if, if we just make automation and we make technology, then we'll just all automatically be better off. And I think in over the years then, I sort of really came back to realize that that's kind of nonsense. Like, yeah, the future can be bright. We can have a fantastic future if we not only develop the technical base on which the, on which we would do that, but also you know change our social relations and uh, you know make actual change. Yeah, I think that's really the the core. There is that we have an incredible amount of knowledge production and innovation that's happening in the world right now, but I think so much of it is deployed in very unequal ways and also in very limited ways, limited scope um, compared to what would be possible uh, with a more sort of uh, open and egalitarian uh, social relationship between technologists and, uh, you know, users and users of uh, what they produce. Yeah, I think with, without that social change, without, without changing the social relations, you just end up with um, better and better technology just being used as 
more and more oppressive ways to control. I think we've we've kind of seen that in the last uh, decade or so with the kind of the 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 early promise of the internet and this kind of what people thought was going to be like a a kind of a universally positive thing that was like a liberating force. Oh, we, we would all live in inside the internet and it would be crazy and free and beautiful. Kind of turned out to be like a surveillance nightmare because we didn't change the social relations at all, which just layered more more technology on top of an existing, uh, you know, frankly rotten base. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, especially I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian and uh, I feel like in the time since I was a kid to uh, when I became an adult, uh, <clears throat> the infringement on uh, personal privacy uh, that happened, not just because of tech, but because of the intersection of tech and like a increasingly draconian state um, has just kind of made things even less... Uh, uh, sort of in, private and free than they were when I was born, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and like I think I think it's pretty pretty safe to say we're both uh, raging socialists at the very least. And uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think there's a the, that terrible Churchill quote, or at least it's attributed to Churchill about uh, how you know as you grow up you're going to become a Tory. Um, but I uh, really haven't found that to be the case for me. I find it's more the, the case you get uh, some life experience in you and uh, you get a more sort of grounded perspective on the way society actually works. And uh, in, in a way, it's more of an incentive to uh, pursue, uh, you know, that sort of communist horizon than uh, what I was even aware of as a kid. Yeah, I kind of think like that's that's a really interesting um, kind of claim where, yeah, because that's the thing that's usually trotted out is like, oh, you know, you'll you'll calm down when you're older and you'll become a you know really conservative Tory uh, kind of weirdo. Um, but like all, I think a lot of uh, younger people, like our, of our sort of the millennials, etc., are are becoming tankies, you know, they're becoming Stalinists instead, which is which is kind of fantastic. Um, and I kind of wonder if it's like, if the actual dynamic is more that like, the longer, if you belong to a generation and the longer you steep in the culture of that generation, the more ingrained it becomes. So it, I think it's more of a an indictment of the kind of boomers that they become worse as they get older. Whereas other more recent generations seem to be getting better politics as they get older i think that's yeah, yeah absolutely um, the the, that yeah. kind of drift can play out over quite a long period of time yeah and we're kind of reaching a point where i think the well i mean we're, we're at this like real weird crisis inflection point really where um i think i think it's safe to say that like the kind of capitalism we've known for so long is just crumbling and Yes, uh, it's it's not beyond possibility that it will just find more and more creative ways to perpetuate its own kind of weird, weird and fucked up spiral of de destruction. Um, but it does feel like we're reaching a historical moment where actually something's got to give. You know, um, yes, a capitalism as we know it will come to an end, and whatever's beyond it is like I think from where we're standing right now, it sort of look like looks like it's going to be this. Um, fully automated, immiserated, neo-fascist feudalism, you know, if the kind of uh, likes of, you know, your Peter Thiels and such get their way. Whereas I think what we what we would prefer would be fully automated luxury space communism. <laughs> well, that's certainly what I would prefer, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the center of the show, is kind of outlining that this this stuff is possible we we can do better in the future we can actually have a egalitarian society that does provide for all of its citizens and we use technology to do that um we can have the robots make all the cool stuff we can laze about and have a great time it, we can have the sort of star trek vision of a sort of highly technical socialist essentially a utopia as it's portrayed in in, in star trek um, and that the kind of the weird neo-feudal horror that's currently simmering amongst a lot of sectors of the kind of popular technology kind of uh, culture isn't isn't inevitable. Like it doesn't need to be. We don't need to be reduced to being just kind of serfs under um, a kind of a gig economy nightmare. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's not only the case that, you know, that sort of neo-feudalism is, is not inevitable, but also I think that if we want to do civilizational communism at any kind of reasonable way, uh, I think that the, the technology is essential to that because, you know, we have a lot of people on this planet and to provide for all of them requires technical solutions. And yeah. so I think that's a crucial point. Like I've, I've been reading a lot of um, the first issue of EndNotes, which I think was published almost 10 years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, in that issue, they try to provide a kind of a, a wrap up of the 20th century and a kind of analysis of why, why exactly it was that the socialist or kind of workers movements of the late 19th and early to mid and later 20th century didn't really didn't actually lead to this kind of um, communist vision that the that we always wanted and i kind of think one of the reasons they start to outline towards the end or in the afternotes is that um it could have just been kind of impossible to really go all the way under those kind of conditions and it's kind of like when you think about it like uh to to fully for example, to face down this kind of crisis of um, environmental collapse, like we need to be massively more efficient in how we produce goods and how we distribute them. And that's kind of going to require something resembling a planned economy, which is plausible when you've got artificial intelligence on your side. It's not so plausible when the best tools available are pen and paper, you know, like in the early 20th century. So it's kind yeah, of absolutely. unsurprising that that didn't really, let's say the... Um, you know, the Russian Revolution didn't lead to a permanent, like an actual kind of transition into real communism um, is kind of unsurprising historically. And like we are we are, at, I think, now at a historical point where this is actually plausible. We could we could pull it off. Um, it's it's no longer crazy to imagine um, a world of plenty where, you know, we don't toil very much at all. And yet all our sort of basic needs are taken care of. Yeah, and I think the the objections of, you know, um, libertarians uh, or Austrian economists mm. like, you know, Mises Proper and theories. Hayek, yeah, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> communism as feasible are in many ways uh, answered by the communication and, and computing technologies we have available to us now. Um, and, you know, frankly, as much as I respect, uh, you know, Marx and Lenin, uh, they had very little understanding of the actual difficulties that would come with trying to organize a communist society when they set out. And uh, they were, well, at least Lenin was uh, quickly disabused of the notion that it would be a simple matter of accounting. So, <laughs> right, yeah, and again, uh, but again the, the best accounting they had was pen and paper. You know that, like, yeah, that was that was the best tool available at the time, and it frankly wasn't sufficient at all. Um, so I I think that kind of segues into um, a kind of point about like part of the point of doing this show as well is that like we on the left who kind of want this better future, we kind of need to update our thinking for the material conditions we actually find ourselves in today, and I think we need to broadly kind of let go like draw a line under the 20th century and just kind of call it done um i think i've sort of observed a lot of leftists kind of get a bit too hung up on how stuff played out in the early 20th and the late 19th century um mm -hmm. and a lot of those lessons i mean you can draw lessons from history but i mean those conditions are literally impossible to replicate um yes and the conditions we have now would have been absolutely unimaginable to to those guys like if you could go back in time and tell peter kropotkin that we would be we would have an agricultural output that could feed 10 billion people he would fucking die of a stroke on the spot <laughs> just like what yeah he would he would lose his fucking mind at that proposition um shit's different now <laughs> you know like uh yes yeah we need updated uh, thinking uh and we need to be reaching like to i think i think like Tech workers, as a broad sort of category, are a very important section of the population now because we've kind of got the, I suppose, the keys to the kingdom in a way. Um, we're 
we were talking about this before, but it's like analogous to where the kind of railway workers were before, where they kind of had so much power over a very important uh, part of the means of production. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the the sort of metaphor of the information superhighway is really sort of tired and, and weak. But the fact of the matter is, is that the information and communication infrastructure that we have is a crucial lifeline of the capitalist system. And tech workers, in a material sense, do have control over its functioning. It's just a matter of not being organized enough to make use of their control over it um, in order to push for progressive social change, right? Yeah, and I, and I believe if that if we sort of leave, if we don't um, put forward these kind of like left critiques of technology, left critiques of society as it relates to technology, and all these kind of things, then we kind of leave that territory on just untouched to be claimed by the right, you know, and it's like you'll just end up with this like really crappy kind of one dimensional libertarian stuff that we observe all around us in the kind of tech sector. And that'll just be well, and, and essentially, you know, to continue the whole railway analogy, uh, these modern day robber barons are going to be dictating policy if, if we don't do it ourselves. Right. I mean, uh, they have ideas, they have intellectuals that work for them to produce ideas that are amenable to their agenda. Um, and, you know, many people stand in awe of the vision that these people have, but we have it within ourselves to be visionaries as well. Uh, we just need to get organized and get thinking. Yeah, and it kind of loops back around to uh, the kind of one of the opening points that, like, this kind of idea of this ap- apolitical technology or whatever like i mean d- don't don't fool yourself into thinking that these robber barons are in any way apolitical or are non-ideological they have a very specific ideology but one that is um so dominant and has has come to dominate so much of our culture that it it appears to be uh transparent and kind of not non-ideological but it's that's all a smoke screen like they've got um specific objectives they've got specific needs and specific kind of motivations for uh for doing for acting the way they do um and it's not a crime for you as a worker to act in your interests either <laughs> this, is the, this is the class relation right like that yes your position in the class uh, structure does inform like what what's in your interests um Class warfare has been upon us for quite a while now. It's just been very, very one-sided. Yes, and I think as as sort of the subordinate member of that relationship between capital and labor, we often feel, you know, embarrassed or shy or afraid to to speak, but to even think for ourselves um, and to to think uh, in a way that isn't something dictated to us by uh the top intellectuals employed by these uh tech elites um and so i think we need to really get over that and we need to realize that like we have creativity and power as well and we shouldn't be embarrassed about using it absolutely um yeah we need to be um yeah need need to be acting as if this is how we get to a good future or at least you know how we avoid a bad future like this this if 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 you if you are this sort of like techie person who does believe in a kind of like automated utopia like you need you really need to get on board with an actual kind of politics to enable that to happen yeah. it's not going to happen just by just by creating ai or just by like creating more javascript frameworks it's going to require actual politics um and so that's what yeah, that's what it, we're kind of here for i mean hopefully we can um, hopefully we can present a show that's informative and fun and um, good good fun to listen to. So I think if we maybe talk about it, like the sort of concrete plans we have for the show. Um, we're gonna maybe split up a couple of different sort of episode styles where we'll maybe in some episodes cover some leftist theory or sort of philosophy from a technological angle. 
And then in other episodes, we'll probably cover technological phenomena and kind of those kind of relations from a leftist angle. Um, we're also probably inclined to um, do kind of like alternating theory heavy or sort of like heavy episodes that have like a, a concrete subject. For example, our next episode, episode two, is going to be um, a review and analysis of Peter Fraze's book called Four Futures. So that'll just be the whole episode. It's going to be pretty rad. And then probably after that, we'll do a lighter episode where we look at some, uh, just some articles or we maybe just talk about generalities um, or even things that may have come up in the intervening couple of weeks. Um, un we're unlikely to cover much in the way of current events sort of stuff. Like, I don't think this is a show that's amenable to that kind of uh, quick reactions. I, I don't think that would be particularly interesting to listen to either. I mean, there are better shows that do that. So, you know, not, not really our wheelhouse, <laughs> I don't think. Um and hopefully we'll get some interviews. Um, I'd really like to get some uh, domain experts on for concrete topics so we can just do interviews about those, partially because it would mean less homework for us. Like, that'd be cool. Um, <laughs> we could just lean on someone to know the things so that we don't have to spend two weeks or three weeks uh, studying. Um, yes. Yeah, have, have I missed anything? Is there anything else in there? Uh, no, I think that pretty much uh, covers what we're looking to do here. So, uh, um, yeah, I think they can, listeners can look forward to our upcoming discussion of For Futures. Uh, maybe take a look at uh, the book if you haven't before, or even just check out the uh, article on the Jacobin website, which is what the book was based on. Yeah, the, the article alone is a good place to start. So that's uh, if you're if by some weird miracle you're actually listening to this when it airs um, and not coming back to it after <laughs> years of listening to the show um, yeah go, go read the article it's really good it's easy, easily googleable um, I think maybe before we wrap up we should probably explain something about uh, the name of the show is General Intellect Unit um, but we the first two parts of that name are borrowed from a, a concept that Marx elaborated on called the General Intellect uh, Kyle do you want to maybe explain what what that whole idea is and how it relates to what we're doing here. Yeah, so I think the the general intellect was uh, something that Marx uh, wrote about in his preparations to write uh, his more famous work, uh, Capital. Um, and it's not really something that made its way into Capital. It was discovered, uh, you know, in sort of subsequent reviewing of Marx's papers um, in the 20th century. And it, it was really him trying to come up with a term to describe how knowledge um, is a part of our productive social existence. And so it's a general intellect in the sense that when we, we come up with science and we come up with these kind of large externalized bodies of knowledge, externalized and internalized through education, um, we create a intellect that is larger than any one person. Um, and this is a sort of process in motion that is a creative and dynamic force um, that uh, helps to accelerate and expand and diversify production. Cool. And is it, that's basically the kind of notion of scientists and technologists standing on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's... Um, it, it, you know, it, it's not just an elite thing. It's a thing that kind of everybody participates in to some degree. Everybody has some know-how. Everybody has something to contribute to the general intellect. Uh, but, of course, people who are more educated, um, you know, spend more time absorbing it and uh, also contributing to it. Yeah, and, like, um, I'm reminded of a, it was a part of uh, Kropotkin's uh, sort of famous bread book, uh, The Conquest of Bread where he kind of talks about this um, thing that like, and to him it was steam engines and, and stuff like that, but that like those inventions weren't the, weren't really the product of, uh, or like mills and all these kind of big machinery things were not really the product of lone geniuses. Like there's this weird myth that like some person is just born and then 18 years later, the idea for a steam engine just leaps out of their head and it's fully formed. <laughs> um, he described it as being a process of like, thousands of unnamed inventors and people who refined processes over the course of generations and you know this institutional and kind of tri not, not really tribal but kind of like yeah social knowledge that's passed down through generations of engineers 
uh, and that forms a part of the the kind of huge common inheritance that we get from our uh, the people who went before us and uh, created the conditions that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that you know I used to be a historian doing intellectual history, and really something I saw in my research is that genius is something we attribute to people uh, when we're looking in on uh, the from the outside. Uh, if we don't really understand the the way that uh, ideas came about, inventions came about, but if you're part of the group that actually came up with this stuff, you can see like, oh yeah, it was an idea from this person over here, and then she came up with this idea, and he came up with that idea, and somehow they all kind of got mixed together, and then someone's name got stuck on it. And, you know, that that's just kind of a microcosm of the general social process that is doing that all the time. Mm. So the, the genius doesn't reside in one individual's skull. It's It kind of resides within the social organism. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's cool. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a really key um, idea to propagate because it's it's so contrary to a lot of the kind of general thinking in in technology and science or just the kind of like fetishization of science and technology. This kind of idea of like the uh, the self-made man, these kind of like essentially lone wolf geniuses who you know, put in, they had the grit and the gumption to found companies and such. Whereas in actuality, they're, you know, using, drawing on a colossal body of knowledge and of uh, collective intelligence that's been developed over the course of generations. Right. Yeah. And I think a decent example of that, which we'll probably get into in much more detail in later episodes, will be the, the open source uh, movement, uh, open source, and even the, the open science uh, sort of movements as well. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, that is a very obvious and concrete uh, way to look at the general intellect because, um, you know, there certainly was a cult of genius to some extent at the time that Marx was writing, but at in the same at the same time, science was a uh, in some ways much more open endeavor uh, because it was not something closed off in national silos, and uh, maybe it was more obvious to him in some ways uh, how this was an open and international and collaborative process. But today, I mean, I think open source software, despite all the factionalism and everything you see in it, um, it's it's a very obvious manifestation of the general intellect, mm, contributions so. of many people. Yeah. Um, which it's, it's kind of an amazing intersection, though, with like the kind of unashamedly Propertarian kind of ideology of um, a lot of the the valley crowd. They're kind of like, well, if if they believe so intensely in the kind of yeah the the, the self made entrepreneur and such, they should probably stop using such communist stuff as open source software. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, yeah, I hate to break it to them, but like open source is a um, you know anarcho syndicalist gift economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think we're I think we're definitely going to have to do an episode on the political economy of open source because I think it's very interesting. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty big topic as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's probably a great candidate to get some people in to um, get some interviews. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, is there anything else we need to cover? Do you have anything else you'd like to talk about before we sort of wrap up? This is going to be a short episode because it's just the really the introduction to um, to the show, and we're we're going to get into the real meat of things in two weeks' time with uh, Four Futures. I don't think so. I think that about covers it. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, thank you, Kyle, for joining me on this uh, weird sort of venture, and thank you, listeners, for hopefully actually listening to this. Um, We'll probably up be up on well, whatever site you're listening to this on. We, it's 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 in front of your eyes. You can see it. Um, there are probably links to somewhere else as well where you could probably follow us. Uh, we'll probably have a Twitter account soon. Uh, General Intellect Unit will probably be the search term you can use to get to it, if it's not linked to from wherever you are now. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd imagine we'd have that infrastructure in place much better for uh, the next episode. 
Uh, but yeah, yes. thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in about two weeks, hopefully. All right, you then. Thanks. Bye.